welcome to this episode of Night Sky News for November 2022 with me, astrophysicist Dr. Becky Smethurst. This is the show where we chat about what you should look out for in the night sky in the next few weeks, and we chat about what's been happening in space news in the past month. We're going to be chatting about Artemis 1, JWST's plan to avoid micrometeorites, and whether water on Earth could have come from asteroid impacts. There's chapter titles down here if you want to skip ahead to any of those specific news stories and any journal articles I mention will be linked in the video description down below, free to read. So without any further ado, let's kick things off and start by looking up. First up, just after sunset on the 28th and 29th of November, we've got my personal favourite pairing of objects in the sky, my favourite planet, Saturn, with my favourite moon phase, the crescent moon, aka the toenail moon, as I like to call it. Now, we're actually losing Saturn from our skies very soon. It's getting closer and closer to the sun from our perspective here on Earth, and therefore closer to the horizon every single day. In fact, by the end of January, it'll have gotten far too close to the sun for us to be able to see it anymore. And we'll have to wait till it swings to the other side of the sun by sort of the end of May, early June 2023 to be able to see it again when it'll be visible before sunrise at around about 4am in the morning. So spot it while you can, while it's visible in the evening sky, much more convenient time to be able to see this. And hopefully the moon on the 28th and 29th of November will help you spot it if you don't know what you're looking for. So look to the southwest in the early evening hours after sunset, where the glow of the sun will still be hanging around and the moon will be just underneath Saturn on the 28th, about a palm's width away, you know, if you hold out your hand at arm's length in front of you. And then on the 29th of November, it will be just to the the left of Saturn. So hopefully one of those nights will be clear for you so that you can spot it. Now the moon is obviously going to keep moving along what we call the ecliptic, the line that marks the plane of the solar system in the sky, until it comes close to Jupiter on the 1st of December as a half moon. Jupiter is the brightest object in the night sky right now. So if you look south at least before midnight at least, you should be able to spot this really easily, even if you live around the bright lights of a city. Then by the 8th of December, the moon will be full and right next to Mars on the sky. Now this will be visible all night with the two rising together just after sunset and then setting together just before sunrise. Now, if you're lucky and the weather's clear, and also if you're lucky enough to have it be nighttime wherever you are between about 4 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time and about 6 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time GMT, so you can work out, you know, usually that's probably most of Europe, Africa, and the Americas that will be dark at that point, then you'll be able to see Mars fully disappear behind the moon and then reappear on the other side. In the UK, it'll disappear about 4.50 a.m. GMT and reappear at around 6 a.m. UK time. Now, the reason that this is happening is because the full moon is happening on the same night as when Mars reaches something known as opposition. When the sun and Earth and Mars perfectly align, which is also the arrangement of the sun, the earth, and the moon to get a full moon. It means that Mars will also be fully lit by the sun as well, in the same way that the full moon is fully lit by the sun when we get a full moon, and it's at its almost closest approach to earth when it reaches opposition as well, which means it will be particularly bright all through the rest of November and into December as well. Now, it technically reaches its closest approach to Earth on the 30th of November, which is when it will officially be brightest. And that's because Earth's and Mars orbits aren't perfect circles, they're elliptical, so the closest approach doesn't coincide with the opposition. So even if you miss the occult of Mars by the moon, look out for it whenever it's clear for you in the next month, because it will be beautifully bright. And again, this is still something you'll be able to spot in amongst the light pollution if you live in a city. Now, another thing to look out for in the next few weeks, if it's clear where you are, but particularly on the night of the 14th and 15th of December, is the Geminids meteor shower. Now, meteor showers are caused by 
bits of rocky debris, you know, left behind by comets and asteroids that burn up in the atmosphere as they fall to Earth. Some are bigger pieces and they burn brighter and some are smaller and so they burn a bit fainter as they fall. So how many meteors you end up seeing in a night, in an hour, depends on how dark your sky is. So how far away you are from the light pollution of cities, but also what the moon is doing on that night as well, because a full moon can really wash out a lot of fainter objects in the sky. This year for the peak of the shower on the 14th of December, the moon is about 70% full and it starts to rise a few hours or so before midnight. But the radiant, the place where all the meteors appear to be streaking away from, won't reach its peak in the sky until 2 a.m. The higher the radiant gets in the sky, the better, because it's when it's lower down, you lose half of the meteors underneath the horizon. So you can see how this is gonna be a little bit of a balancing act between obviously going out when the moon isn't quite fully risen yet, but also in the point where the radiant is high enough. Now normally in completely dark skies, the Geminids meteor shower puts on a spectacular show and you'd expect to see anywhere between 100 to 120 meteors per hour. That's like two per minute that you should expect to see in the darkest of skies. But you can imagine as you get closer to city light pollution and the brighter the moon is, the number that you're gonna see is going to drop. Now I reckon it's still worth, you know, trying to make the effort to go out and spot some meteors this year. I live in the suburbs of a medium sized city and I think my plan is gonna be to head out if it's clear on the Friday night of the 16th of December, you know, just for an hour or so before midnight when the moon's just that little bit older, it won't rise until slightly later until around about midnight. So maybe plan for something similar, you know, with you and your mates or with you and the family if you're all up for it. Now I think that's enough for looking up at the night sky, let's come back down to Earth and chat about what's been happening in space news in the past month. All right, the big news this month was finally the launch of the Artemis 1 mission from Kennedy Space Center on Wednesday, the 16th of November, 2022. And this is the kickoff mission for NASA's plans to return to the moon. It's an uncrewed mission to demonstrate that everything works as it should. The newly developed SLS rocket, which thankfully didn't get damaged after being left out in a hurricane, and the Orion spacecraft, which will eventually carry astronauts to the moon. Now here's the mission plan for what it will do in the next couple of weeks or so. It spent the past week since launch traveling to the moon. It had its closest approach to the moon, just 80 miles above the surface on the 21st of November, which was incredible to see. And you're looking at this view on your screen from the Orion spacecraft as it looks back at planet Earth having launched just five days ago. And then very soon, tomorrow, in fact, Friday the 25th of November, it will burn its engines again to bring it into its stable orbit around the moon. That whole process, you know, as in commands being sent from mission control and then actually seeing seeing it happen is going to be live streamed by NASA as well. So I'll put a link in the video description down below if you want to check that out. It'll then spend anywhere from six to 19 days in orbit around the moon before the return journey, which will take around about one to two weeks, depending on, you know, how many tests of all the systems and stuff are needed. The Orion module will then splash down in the Pacific Ocean and be recovered by the US Navy. Now that could be as early as the 12th of December or as late as the 28th of December. It just depends on how long it spends in orbit around the moon and how long that return journey takes as well. Now, if there's anybody from NASA watching right now, can I just put in a formal request on behalf of all space lovers everywhere that that splashdown is not on Christmas Day this year. <laughs> After last year's ridiculously stressful launch of JWST on Christmas Day. Ignition? Ignition? Come on! I just can't go through anything like that again. I'd like a nice quiet Christmas, please. <laughs> If all goes well, this is going to pave the way for the Artemis II mission, which is going to be pretty much exactly the same in terms of trajectory, It'll launch, loop around, orbit the moon for a bit and come back, except this time it will actually have a crew of astronauts on board, and that's set for launch in around about May 2024. And then again, if all goes well with that, you'll then have another crewed mission that will actually land 
on the surface of the moon for the first time since Apollo 17 in 1972. And the launch of that mission is scheduled for sometime in 2025. For now, though, we're getting some spectacular images back from the onboard cameras of the Orion module, the moon, and of course the Earth itself as well. You know, images that unite us all because every single one of us is in this photo. It's a blue marble photo for this generation. Speaking of incredible images, JD Boyce T has been spoiling us again. On Halloween, the team released another image of the pillars of creation in the Eagle Nebula, this time taken with the MIRI detector on board, which detects longer infrared wavelengths. So unlike NEACAM, which detects much shorter infrared wavelengths that can pierce through dust to reveal the star formation that's going on inside these nebula, MIRI detects wavelengths given out by the dust itself, revealing the structure inside this nebula where stars are forming. Now, the fact that this was released on Halloween was genius on NASA's part. When you remember the fact that all of that dust is there because of the previous generation of stars that lived and died and went supernova and threw it all out into space. So essentially, this region, this nebula, is almost like a stellar graveyard of sorts. So this image really was perfect for Halloween. Now, to keep giving us amazing images and all this science data that we've been slowly getting our hands on, NASA and ESA announced their plan this month for mitigating the damage to JWST caused by micrometeorites. Now, the telescope has been designed to withstand impacts from these, you know, tiny dust-sized particles traveling at very immense speeds, these micrometeorites, that cause these little just scratches on the surface of the mirror of JWST, the thing that collects light and, and focuses it down to the detectors. Now, it's had 14 impacts so far since getting to its orbital position at L2 earlier this year, but despite that the optical performance of JWST is still way, way better than what was modeled for. However, if you remember back in May, NASA announced that JWST was hit by a micrometeorite that was bigger than what was modeled for. And it was a head-on impact, so it had more power behind it, and you could actually see the damage to the telescope mirror from inside the telescope itself. I made a YouTube short about this at the time, explaining why it wasn't really anything to worry about because JWST has been designed to correct for any of this damage to its mirrors, either by angling the mirror differently, or even, you know, we could correct it in post-processing of the images if we knew what they liked before and then after the impact. Now, ideally though, you would minimize the amount of these head-on micrometeorite collisions that do more damage to JWST. And so what NASA did was convene sort of a working group over the summer to give their recommendations for how to avoid impacts like this in the future. And their advice was fairly simple, was don't point it in the direction that a head-on collision is more likely. And they've dubbed this direction the micrometeorite avoidance zone, which we're already calling the Mars. And it's now something that we have to take into account if we're ever planning to do observations with JWST. Now, we already have constraints over where you can point at certain times of the year because JWST always has to point away from the sun so that its heat shield can keep all of the instruments cool. But now we've also got the Mars directions as well in relation to the sun. So it just means that we might have to wait a few months until JWST can point at the thing that you want to observe. Now, it's not that a certain part of sky is now off limits to JWST because it changes as JWST orbits the sun. I actually know some of my colleagues who've already had their observations pushed back from where they were originally scheduled because of this micrometeorite avoidance zone. Thankfully, NASA has updated its observing proposal planning tools to help you calculate if your target was going to be affected by Mars. And that's just in time too, because the other day, all us astrophysicists got a long awaited, very exciting email telling us that the call for new observing proposals for JWST team was now open with the deadline on the 27th of January, 2023. So if you're wondering what the majority of astrophysicists will all be doing in January, it's 
this. They're going to all be writing proposals, trying to write really strong science cases, really strong arguments for why, you know, their targets that they want to observe should be picked over anybody else's for the next year of observations of JWST. This is the same process as for any other telescope, whether that's ground-based or space-based, like the Hubble Space Telescope, for example. I've made a YouTube short before about all the things you need to do as part of that process to apply for time to use HST as an example. As I said, it applies to JWST as well, if you want to check that out. And one other piece of good news that we got in time for that call for proposals going out was that the observing mode on MIRI, the medium resolution spectroscopy mode that was paused due to an issue, is now back up and running. There was a mechanical issue where there was uh, increased friction between some moving parts. It was one of these sort of wheels that moves a filter to let in different types of wavelengths. But the engineering team essentially came up with a way to minimize the amount of motion that you needed, minimize the amount of friction, and therefore reduce the wear and tear on the observing mode. Remember, if you want to know what JWST is going to be observing in the next couple of days, the observing schedules are made public each week. There's also a Twitter bot that tells you what JWST is looking at right now. I'll link it below if you want to give it a follow. You know, in case Twitter still exists by the time this video comes out. All right, let's move on from JWST and chat about this potentially hazardous asteroid 2022 AP7 that's been a little bit sensationalized in the media this month. Now, this was discovered back in January 2022, earlier this year, using the dark energy camera on the Blanco 4 meter telescope in Chile. And then that discovery was published this month in this journal article by Shepard and collaborators, which found three new asteroids by looking for them at twilight. I know what you are. So they're looking just before sunrise and just after sunset, where usually the sky is too bright for the rest of us to take our data. Like I'm trying to see very faint galaxies. I won't see them when the glow of the sun is still that bright. But for asteroids, it means you can search those asteroids that you'd usually miss because they're just too close to the sun for us to spot during the middle of the night. And one of them that they found, 2022 AP7, which given its brightness and the distance away from us that it is, is likely to be over a kilometer in size. It is one of the biggest asteroids found in the last decade, which might give some people cause to worry because kilometer-sized asteroids, if they impact with Earth, could cause global devastation. Especially also since if you look at AP7's orbit, it comes very close to Earth's orbit, passing just above it at a distance of 5% of the Earth-Sun distance, or 19 times the Earth-Moon distance. This is something we call the minimum orbit intersection distance, or MOID as I like to call it. And because this is so small for 2022 AP7 at 0.05 AU, this is what's classified it as a potentially hazardous near Earth asteroid and caused all of this unnecessary media storm that let a lot of you message me on social media worried and wanting assurance everything was going to be okay. What you need to know though is that if you run the maths, Earth and AP7 don't come anywhere close to each other in the next 150 years. In fact, the next time that 2022 AP7 comes within one AU of Earth is in 2332. Although, yes, the orbits are separated by this minimum distance of 0.05 AU, Earth and AP7 aren't at those points in their orbits at the same time. In fact, the Earth and AP7 at the minute appear to be in resonance. So Earth completes five full orbits for every one full orbit that AP7 completes, which is essentially helping to keep them apart and might explain why AP7 avoided detection for so long, because the Earth and AP7 will have been on opposite sides of the Sun from each other. So I hope that helps to ease your minds a little bit. It might have passed the criteria to classify as a potentially hazardous asteroid, but it's not a risk to us. And remember, with NASA's DART mission, we'll also soon have a contingency plan, you know, if we ever do find an asteroid that is a risk to us. So you can check out my previous videos on the DART mission if you want to know more about that. We're sticking on the topic of asteroids for our final space news story, because I want to talk about this study from King and collaborators that analyzed the Winchcombe meteorite and found that the water it contained was very similar 
to Earth War. So let's backtrack a little bit, cast your minds back to March 2021, when a fireball meteor was seen shooting across the skies of Gloucestershire, England, and landed in the village of Winchcombe, with fragments found on people's drives and scattered across farmland. Now, there was a huge public interest in this because it was one of the first fireball meteors that landed in the UK for like 30 years or something. And there was a massive push to collect all the fragments of the meteorite within 24 hours for scientific analysis by some of the researchers at the Natural History Museum in London, where a fragment of this meteorite is now on display if you fancy a visit. The rest of it was kept for scientific analysis, and it actually turned out that this meteorite was an incredibly rare type called a carbonaceous chondrite. To give you an idea, right, there's 65,000 or so meteorites been collected by humans over the centuries to study, and of those 65,000, 51 of them are carbonaceous chondrites. And this one was collected so soon after it fell that it minimized the contamination from Earth. Now from its orbit that was reconstructed from its trajectory as it fell, and then from the exposure to cosmic rays, like if it was, it was pristine or if it was shielded or if it was sort of heavily bombarded over the years, the team could actually tell that this had very, very recently broken off a much larger asteroid in the solar system, which, you know, are relics essentially of the very early days of the formation of the solar system. Now, when King and collaborators investigated the oxygen and hydrogen isotopes in the meteorite sample, so the ratio of normal hydrogen to heavy hydrogen deuterium, so, you know, this sort of atom of hydrogen that's not just a proton and an electron, it's got an extra neutron in the nucleus of the atom, making it this heavy hydrogen, what we call an isotope. And the same for oxygen, you know, did it have these extra neutrons that make it like a heavier atom. They found that that ratio to normal and to heavier versions of hydrogen and oxygen was very similar to Earth. So the terrestrial fraction is shown by this line in this plot marked TFL, not Transport for London. This isn't anything to do with the tube. This is the terrestrial fraction line that marks the ratio between normal oxygen and isotopes of oxygen on Earth. Obviously, hydrogen and oxygen can come together to make water. And it's long been suspected that these carbonaceous chondrite meteorites were what brought the ingredients for water to the very early Earth essentially seeding our oceans, which is where we know life eventually first started on Earth too. But that result was always cast into some doubt because these carbonaceous chondrite meteorites that were found could have laid on the Earth's surface for a very long time and been contaminated by water from the Earth's surface, and therefore that would have given them this similar isotope ratio. But because this sample from the Winchcombe meteorite was collected so quickly, within a matter of hours or so, it means that these results provide some of the strongest evidence yet for Earth's water having its origins in asteroid impacts. All right, that's it for Night Sky News for this month. As always, if you snap any pictures of the night sky, send them my way over on social media or, you know, tag me in your posts as well because I'd always love to see them. As it's nearing Christmas, I've once again put the last shipping dates for my merch store in the video description down below. If you know someone who'd particularly love a Jaded Wisp t-shirt just like this. All next week, I'm also going to be posting my Space Lovers Christmas gift ideas list uh, on my YouTube community. So look out for that and also across all my other social media platforms as well. So maybe that'll give you some more ideas for people in your life that you know who, who love space just as much as we do. Uh, and then of course, also my new book, A Brief History of Black Holes is now out worldwide. You should be able to find it in your local bookstore, or you can buy it online with the link in the video description down below. So until next time, everybody, for our final episode of Night Sky News for 2022, happy stargazing. Micrometeite, micrometeites, why is this going to be so hard? Space is hard, words are harder. Micrometeorite, micrometeorite, micrometeorite. I feel like I should have done some sort of like, you know, warm up, like in Pitch Perfect, like, <laughs> ish, you should easily find it. Because J.D. Rusty has been designed Designed? <laughs> Where did the D come from? JWST designed, I guess. Can't just portmanteau any word, Becky. Now we already have constraints. Uh, constraints. <laughs> Sean Connery's back. He's haunting me. Twenty-two APZ. Z seven. <laughs> I don't know where Z came from.
compared to all of the scattered sunlight still in the atmosphere. Atmosphere? <laughs> it's Friday afternoon and I've clearly got something on the brain. <laughs> there is a plane going over, I'll do that bit again once it's done. I hope you liked my song. <sighs> Come on plane, land already. Safely, but land already. Only 51 of, the, I can't say 51 like that because it just reminds me of Hamilton, like Hamilton wrote the other 51. <laughs> Combinations chondrites with the other 51. <laughs> Why do you analyze like you're running out of time? <sighs> meteorites, combinations chondrite meteorites. Blah, 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 blah. So without any further ado, let's kick things off and start by looking up. That's the first time I've done that clean on a day, like the first take. The minimum orbit intersection distance or MOID as an acronym. <laughs> Faces hard words are harder. 